In tonight's story of our time, the subject is the late and much lamented comedian Tony Hancock, who died in Australia in June 1968. The programme is a personal profile written and introduced by Philip Oakes, who wrote the script for the second of the two films Hancock made for the commercial cinema, The Punch and Judy Man. With the help of some of Hancock's many friends, he tries to answer the question, what happened to Hancock? I first met Hancock when I was sent to interview him for a magazine. He was living in London then with his first wife, Cicely, and two enormous poodles named Charlie and Mr Brown. Charlie was a happy extrovert, but Mr Brown was a nervous wreck. Hancock said that he saw ghosts. They all shared a shambles of a flat, and what I remember about it most clearly was the lavatory. The floor was piled high with letters, stack upon stack of fan mail. It was the only place, said Hancock, that he had time to read it. Times were very good for him then. he just had a successful run in the stage review with Jimmy Edwards, and he was making a name as a radio comedian. The programme was called Hancock's Half Hour, and Kenneth Williams was in the cast. One episode, The Secret Life of Anthony Hancock, put them aloft in an experimental jet plane. H. Hancock calling control tower. Leveling out at 1,800 miles per hour. Everything going to plan. Fine plane, tell the designer chappy. <laughs> Taking her up to 2,400 miles an hour. <laughs> Hang off to control tower. Something strange is happening. There's a peculiar knocking sound on the windscreen. <laughs> Seems to be coming from outside the plane. And for slowing down to 1,800 miles an hour. We'll slide cockpit open to see what's wrong. Good evening. It's <laughs> well, half cold here. You can half hold me. What's that? I say it's half cold here. You can all come in. There's no room. Get off. Oh, don't be like that. It's... Move over. I'll sit on your lap. <laughs> Get your boot off me joystick. Feel nice. <laughs> The script for Hancock's Half Hour was by Alan Simpson and Ray Galton, a newish team of writers he'd met some years earlier. Well, we first, uh, first met Tony in 1951. It was our, our first uh, professional engagement, actually. We were doing a series called uh, Happy Go Lucky. And we went down the studio, and Tony was playing in the one part of the show that we didn't write, which was a sketch called The Eager Beavers uh, for um, scouts, and he was the scoutmaster. And Tony was, you know, sitting in the front row at the Paris Cinema, huddled up there, and, and then uh, we walked past once during the course of the rehearsal, and uh, he suddenly looked up and said, did you write that? And we said, yeah, he said, very good. And that was all. But after that, he came to us and asked us to do a single for him for, I think, Workers' Playtime or something like that, the, you know, the eight-minute spot, you know, closing the bill in the star of the show, Tony Hancock, and he comes on and does a, a single act which we wrote for him, that was, that was the first thing we actually wrote for him. From a radio point of view, it was interesting because he had a, a very visual voice. You know, he, he, uh, you could imagine listening to the radio exactly what he was, what, what he was doing, even, you know, not, even in a, just one word, you know, a yes or a no, would, would, you could you know, get it over visually. That only you know, looked like he sounded. In fact, the Hancock image was still in the making, and a very mixed lot of ingredients went into it. For a start, he'd been to a public school, a fact which rather tickled him. He was born in Birmingham, and he could turn on the accent at will. But his parents moved to Bournemouth, where they kept a theatrical pub, and it was this background, a blend of the raffish and the ultra-respectable, which gave him his insight and his style. He understood about gentility, how fierce and how precarious it was. He enjoyed the acts that people put on, professionally and in private. He didn't lack pretensions himself, but he knew how to turn them to comic advantage. His father, Jack Hancock, was a semi-pro entertainer, and Tony followed suit. He played smoking concerts and stag parties. He billed himself Anthony Hancock, the confidential comic, and modelled himself closely and quite disastrously on Max Miller. He used to recall a performance he gave at a Catholic church hall, blue jokes about land girls and sergeant majors, even one about the bishop and the actress. The payoff was that the audience walked out, and from that day on, Hancock's act was utterly free of smut. The war was on, and he joined the RAF regiment, 
a fate marginally better than death, from which he was saved by Ralph Reader. In those days, Tony didn't worry. He seemed to take everything in his stride. He loved what he was doing. He was the easiest, oh, so easy to handle. There was nothing about him that ever made you think that he would become a lad who would take things perhaps too seriously. In those days, he was a joy to be with, and he was one of the favorites of his unit. He used to take everything in his stride. Rehearsals were a, a lot of fun to him, sometimes when we called very early rehearsals, sometimes when we had to work three shows a day and probably travel back 40 miles afterwards in an open lorry. He was one of the gay sparks of the crowd. We were a family. And I believe that that was the whole reason in those days it was... Now, this is a corny phrase, but it was true. It was one for all and all for one. You see, I was very fond of Tony. And I watched his career. I admired him so much, and, and I, I, I rejoiced in the tremendous success that he had. When one gets successful... Obviously, you're going to be crowded. And I don't think Tony ever liked crowds. What he did like was friends. I'm not so sure about that. In fact, I don't think he had many. His relationships were intense and rewarding for everyone concerned. But underlying the warmth, there was something ruthless, even desperate. BBC producer Duncan Wood remembers. There were times when he could become very moody. He, um, he was a selfish man in some ways, in that um, I think he would be terribly friendly with you and he'd use everything you had to offer and he'd give everything he had back until the parting of the ways came. And then I don't think he would carry on a friendship which had been built up on professional grounds. He wouldn't carry it on into personal ones after that professional association had finished. And this is why lots of people used to say, um, oh, he shuts the door in the face of all his friends. No, he was making new friends in order to find new professional things to do because he was in love with his work. His partnership with Sid James was a landmark in television comedy, but his basis was something more than simple affection. I think he really was the greatest friend I ever had. And uh, very often, Tony sort of, Treated me like a, a father almost, you know. I mean, I'm not that old, but uh, he used to lean on me quite a bit, which uh, suited me because I felt that I put him at ease a lot. And uh, well, he used to worry about his performance and listen, he'd come and say, uh, How do you think that was? And uh, I'd say, Marvelous, you can't do any better with it. I'd make little odd suggestions that. Uh, Perhaps it would be better if the camera went back to him for his reactions, which really was Tony's prime thing. It was television which made Hancock into a national figure. After De Mob, he'd play the Windmill Theatre and the music halls. In the early 1950s, he'd played opposite a ventriloquist doll in Educating Archie on radio. He had his own radio series. He'd even played in Cabaret at Windsor Castle. Very nice class of people there, he was wont to remark. But as Duncan Wood points out, the address where he really found himself was located and furnished by Alan Simpson and Ray Galton. They heard him on radio and they liked him and they liked the way he worked. And it was a character, basically, that appealed to them in terms of writing. <clears throat> and so they created virtually this Anthony Aloysius St John Hancock, who lived in this 23 railway cuttings East Cheam. And I think at the beginning, they, they were sparked off by the way that Tony worked anyway. But then the writing and the real Hancock became almost inextricably woven. Anthony Aloysius St. John Hancock, nature's aristocrat, gourmet, intellectual, and in the words of his creators, a shrewd, cunning, high-powered mug. He wore a rusty homburg, a coat with an astrakhan collar, his eyes brooded above his jowls like lightly poached eggs, and in profile he had the elegance of a melting snowman. Galton and Simpson had him fixed. He was obviously, uh, he, he was certainly middle class, 
uh, probably lower middle class. This is why we this is, this is why we set him at Cheam, because uh, we would we would we tried to pick a, a place which had a certain uh, gentil you know, gentility. I mean, it could have been St John's Wood, it could have been Hendon or Enfield, but we picked uh, uh, Cheam because we lived that uh, side of the world and we knew Cheam. But then we 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 made him live in the in the poorer parts of Cheam. You know, we made you know, a station uh, a railway cuttings Cheam. So obviously he lived in the in whatever in the slum area of Cheam, of Cheam such as it is. You know. Um, he was always trying to uh, you know, better himself, you know, and this, uh, this pretense of uh, intellectuality in the character. Always reading the, uh, you know, the colour supplements. They weren't colour supplements in those days, but he would have been reading them. He would have, you know, he had a bit of knowledge about everything. And, but it was, it was a failure, you know, as well. You know, and he just... Uh, also, he didn't quite fit into this pattern. Uh, because he, he, would be, he would have been considered, had, you know, had he been a real character, had he been a real person, uh, as a slight bohemian. His behaviour would be regarded as uh, eccentric, wouldn't, wouldn't fit into the pattern of suburban living. But at the same time, he upheld as a character a lot of the ideals of suburbia. A lot of, uh, a lot of uh, mock dignity. He, he, would, uh, he would never give in. You'd never see Tony walking off down the street. Charlie uh, Chaplin. Charlie Chaplin style. No, I mean, he, he would be moaning. I mean, if, 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 he, if, if a girlfriend, if he you know, spent a lot of time trying to get a girl, and she turned him down. Instead of him, you know, walking around and saying, oh dear, oh dear, you know, why don't they find me attractive? He would, he would be shouting out, all right then, good luck to you. You know, I mean, you know, I don't reckon you much anyway, you know. Go home, you stupid, you know. The first Hancock's half hour was transmitted in July 1956. In 1957, he won the title of Comedian of the Year from the Guild of Television Producers and Directors. Critics began to invoke Chekhov and develop theses about Hancock as mid-century man. He liked the praise, but it also made him uneasy. He had so much to live up to. The standard was painfully high. For example... Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, nurse. I've come in answer to your advert on the wall next to the Eagle Laundry in Pelham Road. An advert? Pelham Road? Yes, your poster. You must have seen it. As a nurse pointing at you, a Red Cross lady, actually, I believe, with a moustache and a beard. Mm -hmm. Well, a pencil in, of course. <laughs> you must know it. It's one of yours. It's next to Chamberlain Must Go, just above the cricket stumps. <laughs> it says your blood can save a life. Oh, I see. You wish to become a blood donor. I certainly do. I've been thinking about this for a long time. No man is an island, young lady. To do one unselfish act with no thought of profit or gain is the duty of every human being. Something for the benefit of the country as a whole. What should it be, I thought? Become a blood donor or join the young conservatives? <laughs> But as I'm not looking for a wife and I can't play table tennis, here I am. Wait, 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 wait. A body full of good British blood and raring to go. Yes, quite. Well, now, w would you sit down and I'll just take a few particulars? May I have your name? Yes, uh, Hancock, Anthony Hancock. Twice candidate for the county council elections, defeated. <laughs> Honsec, British Legion, Earl's Court branch, treasurer of the darts team and the outings committee. Yes, I, I only want... Yeah, well, we're going to market this year by boat if there's any young nurses like yourself. <laughs> Any young nurses like yourself would care to join us, we'd be more than happy to accommodate you. No funny business, you know. I mean, Thank it'll be either for them up and up. I'll bear it in mind. Yes. Now, a date of birth. Ah, uh, yes. Yes, shall we say the uh, 12th of May, 19... Uh, I always remember the 12th of May. <laughs> it's Coronation Day, you know, 1936. You're only 25. No, 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 the coronation was in 1936. I... <laughs> I was born a little before that in 19... Uh, <laughs> is all this really necessary? Yes. Yes, I'm afraid so. The 12th of May. Yes, I always remember that. The coronation. We all got a day off at our school, did you? Oh. We got a cup and a saucer in a box and a pile of soap. Very good. I've still got that. And a spoon for the Silver Jubilee and a biscuit tin with their pictures on. How old are you? 35. And you. <laughs> By now, Hancock was being taken very seriously indeed. Said James remembers the day that the accolade was bestowed. He came to rehearsal one morning and he said, you, you just won't believe it. You, you will not believe it, but I have been asked to do face to face with John Freeman. So we all said, God, that's marvellous, isn't it? But you won't do it. And he said, uh, no, I won't do it, but it's bloody marvellous. I mean, he's asked me, hasn't he? You know, he's done Prime Minister, so it's, the, it's a fancy asking me. He couldn't get over it. He was in a daze with this. And he kept saying, in the middle of Roosevelt, what happens if he asks me um, about religion? You know how I feel about religion. And I'd say, uh, well, 
I wouldn't say that you'd uh, an atheist because you might lose a lot of customers. He says, well, no, that's unlucky. I mean, I am an atheist. And said, that's the way it is. That's the way it's got to be. I've got to tell him because I'll talk face to face, isn't it? I've got to tell him the truth. I said, for God's sake, don't answer everything truthfully, Dad, because you'd be right in it. And he used to say, he marked down a list of questions that he'd like to be asked. But then finally, when they did the interview, um, he said, he didn't ask me one bloody question of the ones I put down. The questions John Freeman did ask were penetrating enough. Indeed, Freeman was criticised in the press for his attitude in the interview, which was thought to be hostile. Of course it wasn't. In fact, subsequently, the two men became great friends. But as Freeman wrote at the time in answer to his critics, I judged, I believe correctly, that more of Hancock's complex and fascinating personality would appear on the screen if he was kept at pretty full stretch. In the world outside, what would you most like to reform about the world if you had the chance? Um, I'm not capable of doing that. Or did you have dreams about it? Uh, no, 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 no. You just observe and, and, and practice um, within the limitations of your own talent what you see around you. You've never dreamed of playing Hamlet? No, 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 no. I'd hardly... But hey, that's for me, really. <laughs> um, you must have, and indeed I believe you have, in fact, got quite a lot of personal opinions all the same. Let's just take some. Have you got any religious views? Uh, no, I have no religion now. That means that you're not interested or that I'm you're... I'm deeply interested and, and uh, shall we say, I'm trying to find a faith, but um, I've had to... Uh, throw away the initial faith that I was brought up in, and therefore I'm, I'm um, now starting again from scratch. Well, now, what were you brought up in? The Church of England. I see. And you've thrown that away. Does that mean you don't believe in God any longer, or might you uh, adopt some other Christian religion? I'm completely, as I say, um, this has been eliminated now. Um, this I no longer believe in. So therefore, I have to have an open mind and look for something else. I thought sometimes that there was less to Hancock than met the eye. I don't mean that he was shallow or trivial or uninteresting, he was none of these, but I think possibly that we were so intrigued by the surface detail, all those moods, all that melodrama, that we brought our interest to bear on the least profound part of Hancock. The machine was interesting, but it was what it did, the comedy it made, the end product that was so marvellous, and in a sense we took it for granted. We said genius and left it at that. It was Hancock who attended to the detail, as Beryl Virtue, as agent at the time, recalls. We have to remember that the series ran for five years and was not only a huge success, but a consistent success. It always was successful. Every week, this trio, this marvellous trio, of Ray Galt and Alan Simpson and Tony Hancock, turned up, as it were, with the goods, to the point that most of the people in, in England didn't go out on Friday nights, otherwise they would have missed Hancock's half hour. He had great natural gifts too, which Sid James admired. I think Tony was the best that I've ever known to work with. His timing, I've never known better timing. Uh, a lot of actors say this is a bad word to use, but I do not. I, I don't think it's a bad word to use. There isn't a better expression for it. I mean, it's like tiring in golf. It's like tiring in boxing. Whatever it is, you, your weight's in the right place when you're throwing the punch and or when you're hitting the ball. And uh, and this is exactly the same. Tony had absolutely instinctive, perfect timing for radio, which is one thing, as you know, I don't have to tell you. And the other one on stage, and then the other medium, television. I think he's, it was absolutely split second perfect. I've never known anybody time like he did. The only drawback that uh, Tony had, I suppose, as a television comedian was that he was one of these unfortunate people who were in the business of called a slow study. He couldn't learn. Or well, learning became very difficult for him. There are other people who can pick up a script, look at it, and in 10 minutes they'd know the basic outline of it. Tony would probably learn the title in that time, and then days of hard graft would follow to get those words inside the brain. I remember the agony of Hancock learning the script. His method was to record everyone else's part on tape and then shut himself in his office and play it over and over again, inserting his own lines, polishing the words, calculating the pauses. And on the appointed day, he'd lurch off to rehearsal, still stalling for time. We'd arrive at 10.30, spend an hour having coffee. We might have a game of snooker, because we rehearsed in this place, uh, I forgot the name, at Boys Club in, I forgot that. 
and uh, we'd play either a bit of table tennis, which he was very good at. We'd play snooker, which he was very good at. And we'd do this for a couple of hours. Then we'd go to lunch. And uh, those lunches would last about two hours. Then we'd go back and another game of table tennis. And then do another couple of hours rehearsal. By this time it would be about six. And in this youth club, the boys were starting to gather. <laughs> He'd say, uh, Let's, can we go over that one again, Sid? And I said, Tony, now's time I went home. And Duncan would look up, you know, look up to God and say, oh, for heaven's sake, you know, when are we going to get rid of this fellow? Because he'd been playing snooker all day, table tennis. Anyway, we'd get the show together. And then uh, Tony would start with the fitted nerves. And he'd say, I get the feeling we haven't rehearsed it enough this week. <laughs> What did Hancock really want? He didn't care much about personal possessions. He bought expensive clothes which looked a wreck and he was resigned to the fact. He didn't care about pictures. He loved brass bands and male voice choirs and Rimsky Korsakoff and some jazz, especially piano jazz. He liked animals, although he refused my offer of a basset hound because he thought people would point out the similarity between their feet, both bears fixed firmly at a quarter to three. He wanted a house where he could be completely private, and in 1961 he found that at Lingfield in Surrey. He wanted security, certainly, and his earnings were considerable. He wanted recognition on a world scale, but most of all, I think, he wanted an education. His heroes were H.G. Wells and Bertrand Russell, who occupied niches in his Hall of Fame alongside W.C. Fields and Laurel and Hardy. He had a belief, which was sad when it wasn't funny, that most of the answers to existence could be found within a book. God, he'd read the, he'd read Freud, he'd read uh, the origin of languages. This really used to fascinate Tony to a tremendous extent. He'd drag me into Harrods, for instance, and he'd browse around that the intellectual section for hours and hours and hours. What's the matter? Somebody else told you the same thing, <laughs> and. Uh, he dragged me around this place for hours and he pulled down the biggest, thickest books you've ever seen in your life and said, I'm going to have that one. That'd be about 24 quid or something. And he'd order that. And then uh, he'd see something on acting written by uh, some Russian name that not even Stanislavski's ever heard of, you know. But he had to read this guy. Then he'd, read a, he'd grab a book on makeup which he never ever used, and <laughs> he never, never had a thing on his face, ever. When he'd, he'd uh, start trying to improve my mind. Well, it's all very well. <laughs> I think my mind's improved enough. I'm happy enough with it as it is. And he used to get really mad at me. He used to say, for God's sake, learn a little. And I said, I know enough for what I need, Tony. I'm not going to be a professor. I don't want to... Is this going to improve my performance? He said, it might. You never can tell. I mean, you might make a gesture this way instead of that way. And I said, why don't you go and tell Alec Guinness, leave me alone. You know? <laughs> Hancock rarely read for pleasure. He loved Stephen Leacock and A.A. A. Milne. His idea of the perfect tragic hero was Christopher Robin's donkey, Eeyore, forever robbed of his thistles. But he always gave me the impression of cramming for some great philosophical argument. He wanted to be ready. And Duncan Wood saw where his preparations were leading. When he discovered all the facets of the character who lived at 23 Railway Cuttings, when he thought there was no more to say about the character, when he moved round every conceivable position in that room, when we dug everything with the character, the room, the setting, and there was nothing left to do, nothing new to say, then he jumped it. He became bored with it. And uh, this was the... Uh, end of Hancock's half hour as we knew it and the start of Hancock the other six programs that he did on his own out went the Black Homburg out went the Astrakhan collar out went railway cuttings and in came a new character called Hancock with a lot of the facets because he couldn't junk himself he was still playing the same way but he had he was no longer lumbered with that room and with certain things, the trappings of the character, which he, which he thought had been exploited in one end and straight out of the other. 
The new Hancock meant the end of his partnership with Sid James. The split was sudden and to many people shocking. But the man most affected bears no grudge at all. Well, I think he wanted to go on his own because he felt that he was becoming a double act, which makes a lot of sense. There's no question about it. He did do the right thing. I would have liked to have gone on for one more series, but only, only one. And I was very upset, naturally, when he said, uh, well, we've got to break it up now, we've got to make it clean cut. And I said, well, if that's the way it's got to be, that's the way it's got to be. There were even more drastic changes on the way. Beryl Virtue puts them into perspective. The shock of it wasn't nice. Um, I mean, he simply called us all together one Sunday and we went to the White House and we all sat down and we all ordered a cup of tea and then he simply said, well, I must tell you now what I've decided. And I've decided that I don't want you, Alan and Ray, to write for me anymore. And Beryl, because you're so involved with Alan and Ray, I don't want you to be my agent anymore. And then there was this quite deathly hush where we all were very shocked because it wasn't as though we'd had any warning where we'd all begin, begun to fall out with each other and have rows and so on. So, I mean, there just hadn't been any of that. So you can't say he told us nicely or he didn't tell us nicely. I don't know how you could have said something like that nicely. <laughs> I'm certain that Hancock never intended the parting with Gottman Simpson to be final. Years later, he asked them to write from again. But for the time being, that was that. I learned what had happened one day when he telephoned me and asked if I'd like to help him write a film. I've even got the title, he said. We'll call it The Punch and Judy Man. As it transpired, the title was about all that he did have, but as we discussed it over drinks which got bigger and bigger, the idea began to take shape. What Hancock wanted to make was what I can only describe as a serious comedy. The main character was a run-down seaside entertainer whose marriage was failing, who felt that chips were stacked against him and whose future was uncertain. Hancock admired him because, although he was no hero, he refused to go under. What he didn't realise was that the character was largely based on himself. His own marriage was under strain. Professionally, he was in a state of indecision. Comedy for Hancock never was innocent fun, but revelation, a mirror in which we see our true faces. Some of this, I think, got into the film, but not enough. We wrote it in the oddest places, at Hancock's home, in a Paris hotel where we were both laid low with what Hancock insisted was food poisoning, and I knew painfully well was alcoholic poisoning, and in a service flat from which we used to escape to London Zoo. Hancock hated the cages, but for five, ten minutes on end, he'd stand and stare at Guy the Gorilla, a huge, powerful creature, intellect and potential unknown, tragically unable to communicate. It's how he saw himself. The bars of his cage were largely of his own making. It's a matter of history that he drank too much, and it wasn't a case of another little drink. He drank massively. He was what's called a reaction comic, and the drink dulled his reactions. He put on weight, and then he had to diet and sweat it off. He took pills to sleep and pills to wake up. He had a theory that champagne was safe, Sherry was the halfway house and Brandy was the end of the road. A touch of the infuriator, he'd say as the evening wore on, and you knew that the day was drowned and lost. Sylvia Sims played Hancock's wife in the film and they became extremely fond of each other. I was in a slightly privileged position because, for some reason, perhaps because I was pregnant, <laughs> he looked upon me, I think, as a mother figure, that we had this very endearing conversation once we were sitting in the dressing room, he was uh, nearly always either, if I was down there, he was either in my dressing room, I was in his. And um, well, he sort of looked at me and he'd uh, put his arm around me and said, do you fancy myself? And I knew exactly what he meant. And I said, I love you very dearly, but I'm very happily married. I'm also pregnant and I do hate complications. And he was absolutely, he sort of, his face all wrinkled up and instead of sort of, Leaping back, being frightfully offended because I, you know, said no thanks. He took it terribly well, sort of giggled, thought it was very funny. He said, oh, "You're an awful square, you know. You really are a dreary bitch." <laughs> and, but, but lovely. Everyone tried desperately to make the film work, including Hancock. 
At the start, there was a great feeling of unity, of shared purpose. But snags developed, problems multiplied. Hancock became convinced that there was a jinx on the whole production. He was very superstitious, and he blamed everything that went wrong on Punch, the figure that he was supposed to manipulate. He won't let it go right, he'd say, and pour himself another drink. We'd installed a record player in the dressing room, and between filming we'd sit and talk and listen to music. There was one record of mine that Hancock came to love, and finally I gave it to him. The sound of it now brings back that small pink-painted room, the bar in the corner, the piles of clothes, and the gradual winching up of everyone's nerves. Carmen McRae singing Midnight Sun. And I think one of the saddest things I can think of about the film is that he would tell me lovely things that he was going to do in a scene and have me falling about on the floor. Absolutely hysterical. It was so funny the way he described it and what he was going to do. We would go on the floor to do it. And he would get that for the first day. And then he would insist on going on and on until he literally hammered the idea into the ground. It was extraordinary, this thing of a brilliant idea that could have worked magically. He would destroy of his own volition. As the film ground on, Hancock's gloom increased. It seemed to him beyond salvage. It was released in the wake of his first disastrous series for independent television, and it sank like a stone. But the waves that washed over it were 80 proof. It sunk. Desperately wanted to have that the best thing he'd ever done in his life. But he was falling apart then. He was drinking too much. He was coming late on the set. He was trying to tell the director what to do and the, and the producer what to do. I mean, I, I wasn't on the movie, but, you know, in the business, you're told all these things. He told himself. He said, I, I, he said, I can't pull myself out of it. He said, I simply... I would have liked to have quit the film in the middle because I thought it was going to be a bad one. And I'd like to have quit it completely. But he said, I couldn't by that far. We know by that time we'd gone too far and I just had to, had to finish it. And he said, when, actually, when, he said, when I finished the picture, he said, I just wanted to go away, dig ditches, go anywhere, go to France, be a beachcomber, anything, get away from me. He said, I, I, I couldn't stand seeing myself doing that again. There was less and less that Hancock could stand. His first marriage ended in divorce, now his second began to founder. He made guest appearances in several films, then came another series for ITV. It was even more disastrous than the first. And then, out of the blue in 1967, came an invitation to do a TV series in Australia. He asked Michael Whale to help to write it. I actually got phoned up one um, Saturday morning. I was lying in bed about 10 o'clock in the morning, and... Um, this voice came over and he said, um, my name's Tony Hancock, you know, would you, would you like to write for me? And it sounded just like sort of Hancock ear sort of stuff, you know. <laughs> and uh, I was too amazed. I thought it was one of my friends, you know, we're always playing jokes on each other and imitating voices, bringing each other up. And it really was him. And um, that's how it came about. In the past, Hancock had always joked about Australia. He'd once had a wild idea for a routine in which he was transported to Botany Bay as a convict. But once arrived, he found compensations. When I first got to Australia, he, he was ill and uh, he went into a hospital. And uh, when he came out, I mean, the improvement was incredible. And he was right back to what uh, one had seen him, you know, years ago. Uh, he, you know, he was lifting the eyebrow just right and turning line and pulling terrible faces at Australians and making marvellous remarks like, oh, he hated the way that Australia was so sporting. You know, he used to lift those great eyebrows and say, oh, my God, they're all at it. That was the incredible thing in Australia. They willed him to succeed. And you'd be in a restaurant with Hancock and people would very charmingly come up and say, excuse me, um, I would just like to say how much we like your work, Mr Hancock. And he was very shy, 
He never courted publicity, never went to show business clubs in Sydney. And yet he'd rather like that, you know. I don't think Tony ever realised what a vast reservoir of goodwill there was on tap, wanting him to succeed, longing for him to make a comeback. His friends never ceased to love him, although their belief in him may have wavered now and then. He might conceivably have pulled it off. He did make a gallant effort to cut out drinking. He was at least working again. But then on June the 24th, 1968, everything came to a full stop. England had been doing very well against Australia that night. We heard the cricket through the night in Australia, and it was I think it was at Lords or somewhere, and England had skittled Australia out, which would have appealed to him. I thought I was lying in bed about 3 o'clock in the morning listening. I thought, oh, you know, he'll be so delighted tomorrow because uh, he'd go in and tell all the technicians how he'd, they'd been whacked by England. And then in the morning I was meant to meet him. I had to wait out in the road for the car to go to the studio, and... I got a phone call from a newspaper who said, well, we're very sorry to disturb you, but we've heard the most alarming rumour. And I said, oh, well, there are always rumours about Tony going around. I said, well, I don't know, I'll ring him up. And I rang up and his phone was engaged and somehow then I knew something was wrong. I don't know, I just knew it. And uh, then I got through on the phone and the director told me that he died. It was a, an incredible shock. I, I uh, hadn't felt like it, I don't think, since my father died, you know, when I was 16, 17. I, it hit me very emotionally, and we had a wake two days later when, you know, one actually wept, which was incredible, because I'm not that sort of person. The verdict was suicide, the sleeping tablets washed down with vodka. There were two farewell notes. Things seemed to go wrong too many times, he wrote. I heard the news with an awful sadness, but no surprise. I think everyone who knew him had been anticipating something of the sort. It's one of those awful things that you realise when it happens that you've known for simply ages it was inevitable. You just felt that to succeed as he wanted to succeed, he had become rather destructive and ultimately self-destructive. And it's like there wasn't any other possible ending. I heard it on the radio. And I just thought, how awful. But most of all, I felt how awful that he was all over there and we were all over here. I just wasn't surprised. Um, I picked up the newspaper one day and here it was. And it was extraordinary, really. I mean... I suppose I was shocked, but I wasn't surprised at all. And I remember we were sitting at breakfast, my husband and I, and just, I said, Tony's done it. All that day, people asked me, why did he do it? What went wrong? And I suppose we all cast back to when we last saw him, wondering if there was something we could have done, something we could have said which would have helped. I'll never forget, I was driving down Piccadilly one day, and I saw Tony standing on a traffic island, and he looked quite dreadful, quite dreadful. So I looked down Piccadilly and I tried to pull up and get over and see him. He really looked so miserable and so... Oh, God, I keep applying the word desperate to Tony because this is... Uh, well, then I, I got the car parked and then I stopped, I pulled up, but then he disappeared and I, I didn't see him again. That's the last time I saw him. He didn't see me. Wish to God I had been able to catch him that day. You know, all sorts of little things can change people's lives. But he was really full of, full of liquor that day, and he was swaying around on this island, highly dangerous, you know. Oh, odd cab drivers were pointing at him. Terrible, really. It's such a terrible, terrible shame. Pride came into it, I think. Hancock was the very best there was. He practically invented situation comedy on television. His talent was prodigious, and to see it dwindling must have been intolerable. I don't know how you measure a tragedy like the death of Tony Hancock. I miss him as a friend and perhaps even more as an artist. We can't afford to lose such talent. We're all diminished. Perhaps the best epitaph is like Duncan Woods, concise and professional. It was just hard torture to him to work and get things to the state at which he wanted them. This is why he had the reputation for uh, over-rehearsing. 
that um, he never knew when he'd reached the peak. He always thought there was one step more to be taken, and this is where you have to step in as a director and say, no, that's as far as we can go with this. That's it. That's, as, that's what we want. There isn't anything more to be got out of this page of script. If you look from now to doomsday, we always used to say to him, <clears throat> look at someone like Jack Benny. Jack Benny has existed all this time on the basic facets of vanity about his age, vanity about his violin playing, and meanness. And you are looking for endless other facets. Now, you are very, very good at certain things. Why don't you capitalize on them and go on? Because this way lies a whole lot of enjoyment for you, professional stature, and a long life as a comedian, but Tony could never accept it. He was looking always for a new character, and we almost come back to square one. He didn't realize how much of himself was in the original Hancock. And to find a new character, he would have had to alter his own completely, his own personal one, and this he could never do. And whatever he did, I think, had shades of Hancock in it. And he eventually, he tried, he tried desperately hard to find something new to do, something new to say. And because he couldn't achieve it, he became more and more depressed. And in the end, he thought, well, to hell with it, there's nothing I can do anymore. That'll be it. That was very much the Hancock style. When I think of him now, it's with love and exasperation and sadness and admiration. I think of him after a sober working day, clinking the ice in his glass and murmuring, listen to that, best sound in the world. I think of him sifting his anthology of unforgivable sayings and coming up with the winner, the proper, priggish, disapproving refusal. Not for me, thank you. And I think of him standing one night in the pouring rain, lightning sizzling overhead and some malevolent, unbelieved in God threatening doom with peal after peal of thunder. Hancock mopped his face and looked heaven squarely in the eye. Go on, he said, make it worse. I only hope it wasn't held against him. What Happened to Hancock was written and introduced by Philip Oakes. The contributors were Ralph Reeder, Ray Galton and Alan Simpson, Duncan Wood, Sid James, Beryl Virtue, Sylvia Sims and Michael Whale. The research and interviews were by Rita Dando. The programme was produced by Mitchell Rapat.